Hello everyone, I am uh, Dan Croats with Berkeley Lab Public Affairs and thanks for attending our third installment of Sit Down with Sabin, a weekly conversation in which Sabin Russell, sitting right here, engages lab staff about the ins and outs and ups and downs of innovative science. Today you'll hear about the uh, carbon cycle, uh, of course, we also want to hear from you, so there'll be plenty of time uh, throughout the talk for questions. Uh, and now, before we uh, begin, a little bit about our moderator, Sabin Russell. He uh, joined Berkeley Lab just last year after a uh, career as a Bay Area health and science reporter. This included 22 years with the San Francisco Chronicle, uh, freelance work for the New York Times, and a, a night science journalism fellowship at MIT. He's uh, best known for his uh, work covering HIV. HIV both in Africa and the US, as well as the tsunami in Sri Lanka and the Columbia shuttle disaster. Uh, he is now uh, at CSO, Creative Services Office, as one of their lead writers, where you can use him to help you write your documents as well as develop red products and, and things like that. So he's up for hire now here at the lab. And without uh, any uh, further ado, the stage is now yours, Sabin. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Um, today, I think, is almost exactly my first uh, anniversary at the lab as a writer and editor. And um, I still have the same feeling I, I had in the first weeks I was here, that this lab is an extraordinarily impressive place, in part because of the diversity of the science that goes on here. Um, we have the, the uh, nanotechnologists at the molecular foundry, and we have the co cosmologists uh, just down the hall. Uh, we pursue a lot of high energy physics here, and we also have people who are perfecting the low energy building. Um, I think that's one of the great strengths of this place, but this uh, particular uh, afternoon experiment that we're doing uh, is an attempt to uh, sort of broaden the message to all of the labs so that people who may be working very diligently in one aspect of the science can get some exposure to the work that's going on in other places. Um, we also have a very diverse group of people here in the summer. We have student interns, uh, we also have postdocs, and we have staff scientists. So this is a conversation format, again, a bit of an experiment, but the idea is maybe we're going to dial down the science just a bit and uh, talk in more general terms about what we're doing to people like all of us who have an interest in science. and. Um, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's simply a way to, to uh, celebrate the technology of this lab, the, the new and interesting and important things that are done here. And um, so our, our topic today is going to be the carbon cycle. And we are extremely lucky to have a person who is described as a national expert on terrestrial ecosystem, on how terrestrial ecosystems affect the carbon cycle. Margaret Torn uh, is uh, a local girl. She grew up in Marin County, um, attended the College of Marin, transferred to Cal, um, graduated from Cal, and then did her PhD at Cal in um, energy and resources. Still have to use my notes. And um, she joined the lab in 1998 after postdocs at, at Stanford and UC Irvine. And uh, she's now a staff, staff scientist with the Earth Science Division. And she's program head for climate, climate and carbon sciences. So I'd like you all to give a, a big hand to Dr. Margaret Torn. So I thought, Margaret, that um, since we have a broad audience here, uh, I think most of us know what the carbon cycle is, but, but very briefly, explain to us uh, what the carbon cycle is in, in terms of your research and uh, how it's relevant to climate studies today. Let's see, since it's lunchtime, we can start with the carbon cycle that uh, everyone here is experiencing now, which is the uh, productivity of terrestrial ecosystems producing the food that we eat. The other way that we always experience the carbon cycle is through the amount of CO2 that's in the atmosphere, which is making it it's a bit warm today. <laughs> um, but in, as how we study it, the carbon cycle is the study of the element carbon as it is cycling from being inorganic CO2 in the atmosphere to being photosynthesized by plants. The plants die or shed organic material that goes into soil. Microbes decompose that. 
resp respiring, turning the CO2 back to the atmosphere so you have a cycle. And the same thing is happening in the ocean. So we're studying that and we call that a biogeochemical cycle because it's involving biological process, physical process, chemical and geological processes. So that's well, the when we talk about um, scientific research of any kind, we, people often use sort of the metaphor of a, a, you know, the journey of discovery. And um, w one of the things that I think is most interesting about you is that you are literally traveling to do your work. Um, Margaret Torn is a, f is a field researcher. She's not stuck at the bench, like many people here, and um, runs up a lot of frequent flyer miles and probably uh, has built a terrible carbon footprint <laughs> as a result yeah, of that. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, your work has taken you, as I understand it, yeah. um, uh, to the North Slope of Alaska, to Hawaii, tough job. Exactly. Um, uh, <laughs> Russia, uh, right. the, uh, to the Swiss Alps, mm -hmm. to the Colorado Rockies. So uh, why is it that you go so many places to do this work? Oh, that's a good question. So the reason why we go might be surprising in a way, I guess, that um, you might think, well, we go because we need to study each place. But, but really, we're mainly interested in the generalizable theory of how does the carbon cycle work? What controls these processes? And, and in any soil anywhere in the world, you have microbes doing their, their work. And they're decomposing organic matter and transforming it. That releases CO2, which is well mixed. And so it's, it's a very local phenomenon. You have to go somewhere to study it. But it's a global phenomenon that you've got this global CO2. And we go where? where you can study it. It's a really complex system. And you have to be very opportunistic and look for those natural experiments where you can go and actually disentangle the different factors that are affecting ecosystems. And that's the main, the main reason. But there are some hot spots, so, so of the course. So the common denominator yeah. of most of these places yeah. where you do your work is soils. Yeah. And, and, and I think a lot of times when people think of the carbon cycle, they think of, they think of water, they think of the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, how, how important a role do soils uh, play in the carbon cycle, which, um, spoiler alert, I, I've, been, I've been told is <laughs> one of the least understood of the, of the yeah. um, aspects of the carbon cycle. So we have all this sort of hidden, hidden carbon cycle that's down in the soil, but the soils hold more than twice as much carbon as there is in the atmosphere. Twice as much. Twice as much as there is a CO2 in the atmosphere. And it's very dynamic. Microbes can, can be decomposing it, releasing it as CO2. You have new carbon coming in from plants. So it's active and dynamic. But it's really hard to study because it's kind of hidden. It's, it's no, no easy way to see what's happening. So we try to choose hot spots. You go up to the north slope of Alaska because there's so much permafrost carbon. That's an interesting case. Or you go to the, uh, the Alpine because that's going to change a lot. And you want to see if trees will be marching uphill into this new warmer Alpine environment in the future. So well, let, let's talk about some specific places that, that you've been. One of the things that intrigued me was the work that you did in Russia. And that had to do with some archive, archive samples mm -hmm. from a, a Russian scientist right. of uh, 60, 80 years ago. Yeah. Uh, tell, tell us about that. OK. So this is a bit of a history. Uh, but in, in 1997, I went to Russia, went on a field trip driving from St. Petersburg to Voronish uh, with an ex-KGB officer at the wheel and some other Russian soil scientists along. And we dig, dug soil pits. But, but, the, but the history is that 100 years before then, a really wonderful soil scientist and ecologist, Dr. Rizbo Lazinski, had done the same tour and saved these perfect soil monoliths, which were then archived in St. Petersburg. And just after the fall of the Soviet Union, we had access to them. Uh, how, how large were these monoliths? So, they were about as tall as this uh, backdrop, you know, six feet, about this wide Sort of re rectangular core samples? Yeah, so they took not a core, it's like a perfect slab mm -hmm. with a plastic front so you could look at it, or glass, and you could look at the, at that time it was glass, yeah. look at the soil profile. And, and what happened to his work? So, so he, uh, he brought his soil collection to the, one of the first or second World's Foreign Fair in Paris just before 1900. He won a gold prize for natural history work. But he was politically uh, out of favor with both the Bolsheviks and after the revolution. And he was actually executed, and his work was never published. So his logs were there in the Academy of Hydrology in St. Petersburg. But the, the work so, was preserved, and the samples were exactly. preserved. Exactly. 
Exactly. So, so what exactly. what sort of things did you find out in, in your research, and did it, does it have yeah. a bearing on uh, on the work you you do, say yeah. would do here? Well, obviously, this was a, a unique opportunity to actually see how soils had changed. So we knew where they were collected. We went to the exact same spot, mm -hmm. collected soil, and compared them to this hundred-year-old soil. And as a general thing, the neatest thing was just learning how soils record history. That after a hundred years. Um, the trace metal work on weapons in the area was then recorded in that soil. We could see what metals they had used. Uh, the these are nu nu nuclear weapon tests? No, these are more um, the building of we weapons that use trace metals. Oh, I see. Just okay. looking at what had happened I in the area. You can look at changes in rainfall. And in our case, we looked at the carbon cycling as well. We, we did all those tests, but I did the carbon cycling. And the main thing that we found that has bearing now is that black carbon, the pyrogenic carbon, something we call biochar, comes from forest fires, has been considered inert. But we could tell in this system, which had been 100 years without fire, that, that it decomposes quite well. So that, that leads so, us. So, so, you, yeah. so the, the, the carbon actually breaks up and is, right. is um, taken in right. by the microbes? or Yeah, so you could find out that just about anything a plant can produce, whether it's charred or not, there's a microbe there in the soil that can decompose it. And I don't know if people have heard of biochar, and if you think about this as a strategy for sequestration, it's being promoted, and it may have great benefits to put in pyrogenic carbon or biochar into soil. But the notion that it is inert or doesn't decompose, I think, is just wrong. Mm -hmm. And here was a place we could really test that, mm -hmm. because we had the soil 100 years ago, and we had it today. Did you notice any? Really distinct differences between the, you know, what you had archived and the. Yeah. So, uh, you, I, t I gather you, yeah. you took samples in some of the yeah. same spots where you found the archived material. Yeah, I mean, I think I think we were within just a few meters of where those original samples were taken. It was very careful reconstruction, and um, it was amazing how little change there was wherever we sampled in an environment that was still under the same vegetation cover and the same land use. You had just the exact same profile, same color strata, same thickness. And if you went to a place that had been under land use or near an area where there had been erosion, then there were big changes. And then across the whole Great Plains, the steppe of Russia, there was a change in precipitation. And you could see slight, slight differences recorded that way. But really were, the same. were there any lessons to draw yeah. about climate change yeah. just from those, those samples and that 100-year that, yeah. that uh, picture? I, I think we're still working on that, so I would say I'll wait. But mm -hmm. I think that um, you can see changes in, in long-term trends in precipitation reflected in the soil. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, you, you mentioned that several times microbial microbes and mm -hmm. microbial communities, and it seems like you know across many disciplines we're hearing more and more about the sort of the ecology of, of microbial mm -hmm. communities, even in the guts of people. And, yeah. um, and I understand some of that research is driven by genomics, that, that um, we're now able to identify more bacteria um, because you don't have to isolate them and grow them. You can, yeah. you can simply do their, uh, look at their genes. Are, are you doing any of that sort of work or with JGI? Yeah, so we partner with people here like Owen Brody, who might be here, Janet Jansen, who are really good microbial ecologists. And they're finding out that when we look at a soil, <coughs> there's a, let's see, well this, this is my, one of my props. This is a fungus from the cafeteria. <laughs> um, <coughs> but it is a fungus nonetheless. And if you take a- Field researcher. Yeah, a bit of soil, say uh, half the size of this mushroom, in that will be about a billion microbes. Most of them can't be cultured. We don't know, that's, so one gram of soil, if you're keeping track. A billion. About a billion microbes, 10 to the ninth. Uh, most of them can't be cultured, so we didn't know, well, who's doing all this? How will, how will the microbes in soil, for example, respond to climate change? If we have warmer, wetter conditions, what will happen? If you don't even know who they are, what their physiological constraints are, you can't answer that question. Mm -hmm. So it's been really important to team up with the people who work at JGI and help us unravel that, that work. So, so let, let's um, sort of spin the globe a bit to some other yeah. places that you've been. Um, you, you mentioned the North Slope, yeah. um, I, North Slope of Alaska. I yeah. imagine that's a little different from the steppes <laughs> of, of the former Definitely. Soviet Union. Yeah. Um, what, what were you yeah. doing there? So the, and the challenges there are quite different as mm -hmm. well. So in the North Slope, we're studying permafrost because you have so much carbon that's frozen in the, in the permafrost and methane release. 
So when you have decomposition without oxygen in any wet environment, tundra or wetlands, then that material is, you produce methane instead of CO2. And uh, we're fortunate that, and that methane, I should add, for those who don't already know, is a very potent greenhouse gas, something on the order of 25 times as potent per molecule as CO2. Mm -hmm. So we care about how ecosystems release methane, how much, and what will happen in the future. So <clears throat> that's what we were studying in Alaska was the methane release. What sort, of, what sort of findings uh, did you, or were there any surprises yeah. um, from, from that? Well, I guess one thing we documented that wasn't a total surprise but hadn't been as well known was that uh, the microbes in soil actually do us a big favor there. Although methane is produced, probably 80% of it gets consumed by microbes before it gets out of the soil. And there, at least, the primary way it gets out of the soil is through plants. Plants have these that live in the tundra, the wetland plants, mm -hmm. have a, a hollow stem inside called an arenchyma. They use to bring oxygen to their roots. And sort of inadvertently, then, it's a highway for, for methane to get out. So actually, I brought one other prop of our work. Uh, I've been invited an, an to. Important so, tool. This is another tool. This looks like a party straw, and it is <laughs> a party straw. And when you're doing field work, you don't always know what you're going to be looking up and what you'll need. So I was on the North Slope of Alaska and wanted to understand whether this transport of methane by plants was passive or active. Did mm -hmm. the plant have to be photosynthesizing? What, what was it? So we could put plants in the dark and they weren't photosynthesizing, but we also had a little tiny dining hall, a little mesh hall at our field station, which was about mm, three hours south of the Arctic Ocean on a dirt road. And we had party straws, so I could take the plants clip the plants, put in the party straws, and see whether methane came out. And in fact, the rates were at least as high as with the plants. So we published this, and I think this was like a, I, don't, I should have gone and looked it up. Uh, this was a, you know, a plastic conduit, a, a biological conduit. I don't think I called it a party straw in the article. <laughs> but in fact, it was a red and white striped. No? This was our cafeteria, so yeah. So, Did any? Uh, Polar, polar bears come up well, across these party straws sticking say, in the middle of the we're, tundra? We're planning a new trip uh, to Alaska in a month. And um, <clears throat> the Christina Castaño is there, works in my lab and does also lots of field work. And uh, we're going through the challenges. So there, it's, it's quite different. Uh, we, the mosquitoes, you've heard, are bad. But as we hear, they're much worse than that. <laughs> the little black flies kind of line your eyes. You can have a storm coming through. You bring bear spray. Bear spray. Um, it's easy to get lost <laughs> because the sun isn't going east, east to west. It's just kind of going in a circle around the horizon. And it's a rather flat horizon. And uh, it's not getting dark. So you're working 20 hours a day because it's expensive to be there. And so getting lost is, a, is also a hazard. Not, not an option. Not, yeah. not an option, but a hazard, yeah. yeah. Um, so I never encountered a bear. I kind of wanted to, but maybe like from far away. <laughs> you know, <laughs> since <laughs> maybe this year. Well, yeah. you know, we're, we're talking about the, the kind of the tools of the trade. I, I hadn't really thought about a, a party straw as, yeah. as, as one of your instruments, but um, I, I thought maybe a shovel uh, it, it was mm -hmm. one of your tools. Um, what, 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 other, what other types of equipment do you, do you, uh, right. do you uh, use in, in your work? Right. So definitely our work goes from the shovel, which is maybe the low-tech end. I don't know, maybe the party straw is the low-tech end of the spectrum. <laughs> Um, up to maybe the most high tech is an accelerator mass spectrometer. One of our main tools to study carbon is to look at the carbon isotope. Because if you, if you see CO2 or see, if you measure CO2 or you know there's carbon in and out, you really can't track an individual atom. Unless, one of the ways we do it is by using isotopes. So if you have a C13 isotope of carbon or a C14 isotope, you can trace that. But C14 is present in parts per trillion. So mm -hmm. it's really very scarce. And you have to use an accelerator mass spectrometer to measure it. So that's one of our main tools. We prepare pure graphite out of field samples, send them to an accelerator, get our C14 numbers. So is some of that work done here? So that some of that work is done here, and the accelerator is at Lawrence Livermore National uh -huh. Lab. Uh -huh. And so we collaborate really closely with them. So th this is uh, carbon-14 so. dating as mm -hmm. uh, like in, in... The way an archaeologist would do ar it. An archaeologist would use. Much uh, the same. And, and are you, yeah. is that sort of um, time information uh, turned out to be useful in your, in your studies. Are, is it right. helpful in, say, yeah. tracking the, right. the, um, the levels of carbon right. um, that are sequestered or right. over, over a longer period of time? Are you finding anything? Yeah, so the same way that an archaeologist can use radioactive decay to know how much 
how long a grain was in a vase or in a, you know, in a container in a Greek uh, site. Um, we use C14 as a clock for how long ecosystem carbon was in the soil. So we use that radioactive decay as a clock. Uh -huh. And one thing that we've learned in, in our work is how long soil organic matter stays. In most soils, if you get down below the surface, you have organic matter that's there for tens of thousands of years. Tens of thousands. Tens of thousands of years. Unless you plow it. I mean, unless you do something. Go in and disturb it. No, it was it's that, incredibly was it, stable. Was that an unusual so, finding? Was that what people expected? Yeah. No, I think people expected it to turn over much more quickly than that. People had thought maybe hundreds of years. But we find samples that are almost depleted in C14. So that's 50,000 years old. Wow. Yeah. And that's really one of, the, one of the things I read in some of the materials you sent me about your work mm -hmm. um, that surprised me is, is that apparently most of the carbon cycle activity that takes place in soil takes place fairly near the surface. Uh, you can have uh, uh, three meters of, yeah. of soil, but it's really in the upper tenth or so? What, what, how does that work? Or maybe I've misread your, yeah. your research. Well, there is, soils are, it depends on the depth, depends on the rock, but mm -hmm. let's say they're anywhere from yeah, this deep, 20, 30 centimeters to a few meters. Mm -hmm. But all the plant roots are, mainly the plant roots are living at the surface. That's where mm -hmm. the nutrients are, that's where the rainfall first comes into the soil is moisture. So you have all the roots are concentrated up at the surface, and that's sort of the action. And most people just study the surface. And one thing we've done in our work is take the shovel and dig a little deeper um, and, and learn that it's actually kind of a different world as you go down, that there are different microbes, and that's where the organic matter is staying for, as I said, for 10,000 years, even though uh, all the organic matter thermodynamically should decompose. You know, just like the, the food that we eat. I mean, plant products mm -hmm. are, have a lot of energy in them. Well, it, so, so if you have this very ancient organic mm -hmm. matter uh, just a few meters down, mm -hmm. does, does that mean that it really isn't cycling, or is it just a very slow carbon cycle? I think it's a very slow cycle. And then it just depends on the microbial community and the whole ecosystem there, what the climate is, the mineralogy, and that's controlling the rates. But I think it is, it's dynamic. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so let's, let's go traveling again. Um, you mentioned that you, you do work um, in the Great Plains. Mm -hmm. and, and there it may not necessarily be soils work, as right. you said. said. What, right. what, what, what are you looking for in the Great Plains? Yeah. So in the Great Plains, yeah, our study is atmospheric carbons. We're studying a very large region. Uh, it's the size of an old GCM grid cell, which is about 300 kilometers by 300 kilometers. We have a big team project, and some people are here, Sebastian Barod and Mark Fisher, and several people helped us set up uh, a, a, a coordinated suite of instruments throughout this very large region. We have an aircraft flying with instruments. We have a tall tower. And we're measuring atmospheric composition and the land surface and trying to see how does the land surface really influence the atmosphere? Can you, can you pick it up? Because I think for a lot of people, it's a, it's a bit surprising that anthropogenic activities, our human activities, can change the atmosphere, the way that we're, we're causing the rise in atmospheric CO2. So here we're looking specifically at what are these plants doing and what's happening in the atmosphere. And, and in fact, if you look at multiple species, you look at CO2 and CO, we look at C13 in the, in the CO2, you see a distinct signature of land use, what we're doing there in the Great Plains, wheat fields, pasture, on the whole atmospheric profile. So you see the CO2 being drawn down in the summer. So uh, essentially water. right above that kind of activity you're measuring? Yeah, the, the but all the way up to 15,000 feet. And so we, that's the airplane part. Okay. Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, you mentioned, um, not, not that far away, the Colorado Rockies, mm -hmm. a, another different environment, yeah. um, mountainous environment. Um, uh, is the science different up in a mountain than it is um, yeah. down on the plains? Yeah, I guess I was saying we're sort of opportunistic, so we're looking at each site, what can we learn here? And what we're studying right now in the Rockies is, is a different question on the carbon cycle, which is what will climate change do to forests? And in, in particular, as it warms, can, can forests really march uphill? Will we get the subalpine forest uh, marching in the sense of trees, seeds falling, trees growing, new forests emerging higher up in the, up in the alpine? And um, if you'll forgive me, one more prop. Sure. Thanks to the dining hall. Um, this, this may not look like an ecosystem experiment, but this is a french fry. And if you're trying to think about how would you 
simulate global warming? How do you simulate and look at the effects of enhanced infrared radiation? So we have more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, more downwelling IR. Well, we use IR lamps in the cafeteria and in many eating places to keep food warm. So if it's not fresh out of the fryer, it's sitting under an infrared lamp. So a professor who was a mentor of mine, John Hart, got the idea that we could get these lamps from a restaurant supply and suspend those over the soil, and then we would have an infrared heating experiment. And that was part of what I did for my dissertation, was to set that up. It's now running 20 years later. It's still going. And uh, we have this new experiment now in the Rockies, planting seedlings. And this is a big team effort of many people. Um, warming the soil, the snow melts earlier, uh, and the seedlings dry out. So even if the seedlings do move uphill, there are real constraints on whether or not we can get new forests. Whereas on the other end, the southern end of forests, it's getting very warm. And we're worried about contraction when we lose those forests. We, we have um, a rule here of no PowerPoints, but yeah. we, we do allow props. And, and I've been staring at, <laughs> at this, uh, yeah. this device, which is, right. looks a little more high tech than a French fry. Um, what, exactly, okay. what exactly is this? <laughs> yeah, this is not from the cafeteria. Actually, this is an infrared gas analyzer. So any of you who know anything about climate change will know that it's being caused by uh, increase in greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gas means absorbs infrared. So you can make a device with a laser, in this case an infrared uh, laser, and that light is absorbed if there's CO2 in a cell. So this device is actually up in here is, a, is an infrared laser with a mirror. So it's a very long path length, but it's, it's made for field work. So this is, again, a device for the field. And um, this part you can put around a plant leaf, capture it, and you'll actually measure the CO2 exchange with the atmosphere right there. So you're measuring the photosynthesis rate. This is a living, yeah. a living plant. A living plant. Or you can take this same device, this upper part, and put it on a chamber that looks a bit like an old coffee can, put it over the soil, and measure soil respiration. So you're getting a real-time measure of CO2 flux. So, and you can take it anywhere that you can carry this and the battery and the little computer that goes with it. So what, what will that set me back when I go to Radio Shack to, yeah, pick, up, right. to pick up one of those? No, it's about $24,000. $24,000? Yeah. Okay. But, and well, well worth it. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. you know, we, we, we talk a lot about the, the, some of the journeys that you, you take in order to do your science. I, I was kind of intrigued in reading, reading your biography of kind of your professional mm -hmm. journal journey um, that, that um, you didn't start out thinking you were going to be a scientist and, and uh, you, you worked in your, your family store in, mm -hmm. in San Rafael. Tell, tell me a little bit about how you got to be here. Yeah, yeah. So my, for three generations, my family had a food business um, with nuts and dried fruits, a farm, nuts, dried fruits, and then we had a food store and I worked in the food store and sort of the plan was I would keep working in the food store and inherit it from them and, and keep going. That was called the Torn Ranch. That had our had our name, and uh, I just started spending too much time out of doors. Sorry, I think that's me, and uh, just you know fell in love with the environment. Said I have to do something that I feel is contributing to to understanding the environment and, and just working in it. But I still had to work in the store. So as you say, then I I mm -hmm. went to community college and still kept working full time. So it took me a long time to get out of school. But <laughs> but you know I think a lot of people think that um, you know, the path to science is elite yeah. universities, and of course you, you did yeah. go to Cal, but I mean, did you find that um, College of Marin was a, was a good experience um, for um, you know, an ambitious young woman? <laughs> yeah, maybe I didn't know I was then. But, um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a great, I mean, you, going to community college, you have small lectures of teachers who are there to teach you. They don't have another job of, say, doing research as well, and the demands. So the classes were small, and they were, they were great. So, our, and yeah. we've had a student, I just say that we've had several student interns in our lab who go to community colleges as well, and they've been great. So. Did, you know, as, as a Marin County teenager and, mm -hmm. and a person who is able to kind of pursue your passion about, you know, saving the earth in so many ways, did you ever find that that, that conflicts with the, the sort of the scientific um, ethic that you, you simply have to observe it, the re, observe what's out there and report the results. Do you ever, do you ever find mm -hmm. a conflict there or do you find it actually fits in very well? Yeah. That's an interesting question. I mean, we already talked about the flight miles. 
So, right. <laughs> and when you're doing an elevated CO2 experiment, let's say you want to know the effect of rising CO2 levels on a plant, you end up emitting an awful lot of CO2 to create your elevated CO2 experiment. But no, I think, uh, I mean, for one thing, on a very practical level, the footprint of our experiments, yes, we go out and manipulate the environment, is really very small compared to what we need to do on the land to produce food, to graze animals, we produce fuel, fiber from, from natural ecosystems. So, mm -hmm. so many systems are managed. And actually, our footprint is, I think, is pretty small. And you don't want to go totally change the ecosystem anyway, because then you're not learning what you set out to learn. So you're trying to have uh, kind of a low impact as you go, except for the flights. Yeah. <laughs> now that you've mentioned that, I can't the, the, the forget. <laughs> I remember attending a, an exhibit at the California Academy of Science where they do the carbon footprints, and it, it, it was essentially a balance scale, and, and uh, almost yeah. all these wonderful things you could do, you can improve your carbon footprint, yeah. but as soon as you hit the, hit the, the mm -hmm. airlines, it just totally blew it out of the water. It's, it's very <laughs> discouraging. Yes. But, but what, about, what, what, about the, what about the science of, of, um, of, of um, the carbon yeah. cycle? I mean, do, do you... Do you find it as sometimes just depressing um, to, to see what, you know, the yeah. kinds of findings you're, you're getting and uh, does it make you fear for the future? Um, how, how, do you, how do you balance that? That's a good question. And I think I'm going to come back to that in sort of a roundabout way that when people are thinking about what to do, the advice I've heard and the advice I think is really good is that you pursue what you love. You work on what draws you in aesthetically. And that's a saving grace because then as you're finding out that there are really big risks that ecosystems may uh, generate positive feedback and amplify global warming that we're causing. Or you find things that really are scary. At the same time, you're working on what you love and sort of there's an aesthetic there that I think keeps you going and makes it very rewarding in that sense mm -hmm. and not, not depressing. Um, yeah. I noticed one other item in your, mm -hmm. <clears throat> in your collection of, oh, yeah. of um, Show and tell it, uh, and, and this appears to be a route. It, mm -hmm. It's probably a little difficult for people um, <clears throat> in the second row to see this, but but roots uh, just must play a, a, a central role in in, in, in your yeah. studies. And it, what 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 is the the function of a root in the carbon cycle? Um, I mean, I think we think a lot about carbon cycles and leaves and, right. and photosynthesis, yeah. but what about roots? What role do they play, and, and uh, are, the, are our friends the microbes involved right. in those as well? Right, so this is a root from a coast redwood. It's a uh, Sequoia sempervirens. Some of you are visiting California this summer, then you may not know it's the tallest tree, taller than the Statue of Liberty, it's sort of standard old growth sequoia. And, uh, but they produce little tiny roots, just like any other tree, and they're very, very shallow. You know, there's just enormous tree small little root system, but what we want to know is how long do these roots live and how long do tree roots live in general? Uh, we know about the wood, that's easy, but you can use C14 as a clock for the, for the roots as well, and we found out that these little fine roots, if you can see them, they're about a half a millimeter in diameter, which, and they were thought to turn over on sort of months, grow and die, they can live 10, 15 years. So the tree or plant is really investing in these roots from the point of view of the carbon cycle, it means that trees pump less carbon below ground than we thought. Less carbon. Less carbon below ground than we thought, but at the same time, we're learning that this is the main source of soil carbon. So there must be this very efficient transfer from the root to the soil, because we're putting in less than we thought, but we still have a lot there. So it means we have a very efficient retention. So it's, a, it's sort of a simple story, but it's changing how we model and understand how trees grow and what might happen in the future. So put that back. We um, also wanted to make sure that yeah. you folks in the audience who have uh, any questions about the carbon cycle and, and about Margaret's work, um, you know, please, please ask them. We, we, we have Dan and Julie with, um, with microphones. Uh, if anybody has a question, um, this would be a good time to ask. You mentioned that you, had, you did some research in Russia and you uh, had some samples from 100 years ago that you could compare with. What, uh, what sort of patterns did you notice the, between the 100-year sample and what you found yeah. in the soil? Well, one thing that had happened in those 100 years was the area that we sampled had been preserved and there were no more wildfires. It had become all wheat, wheat fields and so there was no more burning and no more input of black carbon or biochar. 
And one thing we discovered was that in that 100 years, the soils had lost about 25% of the black, black carbon or biochar that had been in the soil. And that's one way that we know it does decompose from the soil. We found an accumulation of some trace metals that, um, that indicated some metals that had been used in, in weapons production, I think I was mentioning that, in the, in the region. Um, and beginning to think that, it's a small thing, but that calcium and the changes in the calcium in the soil as precipitation change were responsible for a lot of changes in soil structure that we were finding. So that's something we're still looking up for the calcium. But otherwise, as a soil profile, the ones in preserved landscapes were just the same, you know, to the, to the centimeter of thickness of each layer. Another question over there. You mentioned the biochar degrades much yeah. faster than people would claim, yeah. but then you also said that if the carbon gets yes. down a meter or two, then it stays for tens of thousands of years. I guess that leads yeah. to a question of what's the best way to pull carbon out of the air and put it down right. a couple meters so it'll stay there for tens right. of thousands right. of years. So what you just mentioned is kind of the central conundrum in our work that any plant material, black carbon, really anything you find is just thermodynamically un unstable, favorable for decomposition. And yet, this fundamental question, why does organic carbon persist in soil for 10,000 years? And what we're finding out, and I think pioneering here, is that it's, it's an ecosystem property. It's not a property of this little molecule. You can't breed a plant to produce more lignin or char material and just put it in. It's an interaction of that material, it's miner the mineral, matrix that it's in, the microbes that you have, the climate, and that's what gives you a, a decomposition rate. So it's much harder to predict, and it can be very, very slow. So then back to your question. Um, it, it, I do think that carbon in deep soils is preserved very, very well, and that roots are probably the only ecologically sound way to get it there, because otherwise you're digging up the soil, which causes decomposition, and that's what you're trying to avoid. So the most simple answer would be deep deep roots and preserving the plants that you have that are growing now because that's the established root network. That's the way to, the way to go. But I, I was just at a meeting in Venice with a group of people. This is for the uh, IPCC Working Group 3 who are interested in climate mitigation. And they wanted to know about what's called carbon dioxide removal. It's, it's almost a form of geoengineering, as they're saying it, which is that the CO2 is out there. What can we do now? What, now that we've let the cat out of the bag, I guess, how do you get it back in. And plants do take CO2 out of the atmosphere, but there is so many, so many competing demands for ecosystem services that I, I, don't, I don't know that that, something that we'll start studying more, but it's not like there's a whole lot of landscape that's just waiting to be managed differently, say for our purpose of taking up carbon. And I don't think we should count on ecosystems as getting us out of the mess. Even though plants are very good at taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, um, they, Fixing carbon requires water, it requires nutrients, it requires land, and there's just an awful lot of demand for all of those resources. And we had a question, question over on this side. Uh, you mentioned uh, methane and the permafrost. Yeah. Um, a few years ago, there was a scare about uh, in Russia about a huge potential for the huge release of uh, methone, methane from the mm -hmm. permafrost. Would you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, the, the greatest way to get the sense of that is there's a, a YouTube video of um, people out on, in the permafrost, it's a snow-covered area, and there's a thermokarst lake, a little shallow lake underneath, and somebody takes a match and lights it by a hole in the snow, and it just erupts, because there was so much methane coming out of this thermokarst lake, you know, and everyone jumps back. And there's t if you do field work in, in Siberia, people, I don't know if it's true, the tale is that, um, you, you can heat your tea, your samovar, your, with your tea in it on a methane flame. I don't know if that's true. But you have all, what I do know is true is that you have an awful lot of organic carbon in the soil that as permafrost thaws, that material is more bioavailable and uh, the conditions are very conducive to methane production. So the questions are how fast can that permafrost degrade? And to what extent will that methane be consumed right there in the soil by other microbes or find its way out through, you know, through the party straw or the, or the plant? And those are difficult questions about how the whole landscape will evolve. But, but starting in one, one month, we're going on a, on a scouting trip. 
<clears throat> in uh, Barrow, Alaska, and then on the Seward Peninsula near Nome to scout for field sites, where we'll be trying to look into that question in a 10-year experiment. So then maybe we'll know more, 10 years. Opposite side over here. Yeah. You mentioned that the um, microbial community, the microbes in the yeah. soil, are not well understood that there's a billion of them per gram or so, and that there are many different types, and that it's not possible to culture them, which surprised me when you said that. So I'd like to understand more about why it remains so mysterious. Yeah. Well, the simplest reason about culturing is, imagine the complexity of a soil ecosystem. You have fresh root inputs coming in. You have films on a mineral matrix. It's very sort of delicate system. The minute you bring it in the lab, that's, that's gone. They have all this abundant oxygen. It's probably drier. Um, maybe different, different predators or not. And so it, it turns out not just to be difficult to culture them, but to know you've done it. How do you know? OK, you've got something growing. What is it? Uh, you can't go to a little plant. You know, For plants, you can go and you key out the flower or how many needles there are. And that didn't exist for bacteria. You know, where would that come from? Until you can get at the genes. So now, with the Joint Genome Institute and some other institutions, you have the ability to look at the DNA and the RNA and say, what is this? Where did it come from? What other microbes is it related to? Is this an ancient, ancient phyla? You know, that kind of question. And so for more, though, I'd have to turn it over to Owen, who's really an expert in not only what's there, but um, how does it relate to the environment? How does environment control the behavior, then, of this amazingly complex mixture of microbes? So then it'll be your turn. <laughs> to, I mean, at least to come, you'll have to come up here someday. <laughs> I, I, I think that's a great question. Um, we, we've struggled with trying to characterize microbes from natural environments for that reason, that they're not culturable. I think it, the, the estimates go from somewhere from 0.01% to maybe 20% if you put in a lot of uh, time and effort into culturing those organisms. But the, that's, that's the number of organisms you can culture from soil. The diversity is far lower. Um, so there's, there's a, our, whole uh, branches in the phylogenetic tree that are not represented by any cultivated isolates. So people like um, Jonathan Eisen and folks at JGR are trying to get the genome sequences for these organisms. Uh, not only does that tell you what type of organism it is, but it also gives you some information about how you may culture those organisms. So there's a, there's a feedback. Yeah. I, I just have a, a yeah. uh, sort of a follow-up question of that myself. Yeah. That if you are able to use genomics to identify greater numbers of these microbes in these microbial communities. Can you also get a little sense of their function through, through the genetics? Yes. I mean, it's one thing to be able to count the bugs. Yes. Um, but what about actually being able to know what they do? Are we making any progress in, in that, that field to sort of further understand yeah. the um, right. ecology, uh, the microbial right. ecology of soils? I think you'd have to say probably in the last five years that has just taken off this challenge and being able to meet it of not just what's there, but what function do they play in the environment. And you can do that initially just in the lab. What proteins do they produce? What enzymes are produced? And now you can go out and get field samples and do what's called proteomics, and all the proteins that are produced. And it's a nice um, melding of very basic science in the genomics with very applied science, the, the uh, JBay, the Joint Bioenergy mm -hmm. Institute, is, um, is using that kind of information to say, can we use uh, microbes to help us convert plant material to cellulosic biofuels, just as an example. But really, they're developing a lot of techniques for understanding the function of, of microbes. So there could be yeah. some very practical spin-off from this yeah. uh, field research. Right. right. Yeah. Question over here. Yeah, um, going back to carbon sequestration, yeah. I was wondering, um, you said that once the carbon's down in the soil, whether or not it remains inert is a sort of a function of ecosystem properties. If we've already profiled the soil and know a, about the ecosystem properties, how safe of a bet is it that mm. they're not going to change and that yeah. you know once we get the carbon right. down there, that it'll stay down there? That's a great question. So once you either you find old soil organic matter deep in soil or you can put it in there where you think in today's conditions, it ought to be stable. What will happen to it? And we have a real challenge that in the next 100 years, the predictions are that Earth will be quite a bit warmer and that rainfall regimes will change, so soils will be wetter or drier than they are now. And we really don't know how that will affect microbial activity and sort of accessibility 
of carbon to microbes. So we're trying hard to, to learn how to model that and, and, and how to predict it. But it turns out to be a very difficult question because if you go to natural environments, they're in a sort of semi-equilibrium that's established over thousands of years. If you do a little incubation in the lab, it's, it's done over one year. And we want to understand this kind of evolution over decades. So I think that vulnerability question is really open. A great, you should do research on that. Hi, um, can you talk a little bit more about um, the, the influence of the mineralogy on the decomposition rates? Yeah, I've got Becky Sutton sitting next to you, put you up to that. <laughs> She's hiding. <laughs> so, uh, it, yeah, it turned out to be rather complex that compounds that you think would be very labile, like a protein or a sugar, if you put them in a petri dish with a microbe, they will disappear in hours. But instead, you put that same material into soil, uh, especially soils that I've worked in, like in Hawaii, that are volcanic ash, lots of surface area, lots of reactive aluminum, and they form this, the carbon forms very strong bonds or interactions on that mineral surface, and the microbes don't seem to be able to then decompose it to very small, so-called labile material. Don't ever believe that now. If people are telling you something's labile or recalcitrant, just throw out the terms. It depends on what's happening, and these mineral surfaces seem to be able to stabilize the carbon for a very long time. And I think vintners know that. I think that there's fields in which people use different kinds of minerals to bind proteins and get them out of soil. Or, but we're just learning how important that is, or I should say, get them out of wine. But we're just learning how important that is in the, in the soil environment. And um, that's one reason that I worked in Hawaii, because in Hawaii you have these, uh, the islands are all different ages, and they're all formed by this plate moving over the same tectonic hotspots. You have the exact same parent material coming up, being formed, but you can look at ages. We looked at sites that were 300 years old and sites that were 4 million years old. So, so you have a, a natural laboratory a natural with, with laboratory. The, the age of right. the islands as they pass over right. that hot spot. And, and, right. um, and yeah. uh, very interesting. I mean, what, yeah. what, have you, what have you found is are the oldest, uh, the soils in the oldest islands the, the, the most carbon rich? Or what, what? No, so it, it peaks in the middle. So you get this weathering and you get very much more reactive minerals, a lot of iron and aluminum on the surface. They can bind the carbon or have some interaction with it. And then as the soil gets old, it weathers, it loses the charge, and actually lo the ecosystem loses carbon. So you'd have one site with half as much soil carbon as another, even though the plants were just as productive. And it was the mineralogy that had changed and could no longer sort of sequester or protect the carbon. So going back to the original yeah. question, mineralogy is a, plays a huge role in, yeah. in, in carbon sequestration yeah, and, and, and in the ecology of, of the soils. I, I, I'm just kind of curious about um, almost, you know, how do you define soils? It sounds basic, mm. you know, everybody knows what dirt is, but I, I mean, do, what, about, what about the soils next to a swamp? Does that count because it's, it's under, halfway underwater? Or what about the soils so, at, right. at, at the beach? <laughs> or do, do they qualify, does a, does yeah. a beach uh, qualify as soils? There are several people here who know much better exactly how to define a soil, like, like Umakan. But um, I think for this purpose, the soil has been, it's, it's not the bare rock. It has been changed by biological and chemical and physical activity to become something different. So it's, again, a biogeochemical process of some kind of weathering. And you have organic acids from plants that are causing changes. And you develop some, you begin developing some kind of structure that reflects that environment. So you grade then from soils to sediments. You were kind of getting, you were getting into sediments and I don't do sediments, I'll leave that. <laughs> well, yeah. when, when I think of uh, soil science when I was in high school, it was almost all agriculturally driven. Mm -hmm. uh, soil was all about topsoil and the fact that we were losing yeah. topsoils. Um, yeah. well, let's go to that basic question about to yeah. our topsoils. Is there something about topsoil? We know it's great, it's great for farming. Yeah. What, what about for the carbon cycle? Is, yeah. it, is, it, is the fact that it's great for farming also make topsoil uh, great for the carbon yeah. cycle? And hence, should we be worried about the carbon yeah. cycle when we're also yeah. talking about the, the right. worldwide loss of topsoil, for right. instance? I mean, now I'm not going to remember the quote, but didn't, didn't uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt say something about the country that takes care of its soil? No, I'm really going to get that wrong. Takes care of... Not at my fingertips. Okay. Someone probably knows that out there. But, um, yeah, the topsoil is where the fertility is. That's the nutrients. That's the water holding capacity. 
So that's where you need to grow crops, and it's the, play, it's the part of the soil that's vulnerable to disturbance. If you plow or remove vegetation, you have erosion, and you're losing that topsoil. And it's very, very slow to regenerate. So it's, it's not that it's completely a non-renewable resource, but we really ought to treat it as a non-renewable resource, that we really protect the topsoil. But, yeah. but is, is the best topsoil also the best yeah. carbon, carbon recycler or cycler? Oh, that's a good. Well, to the extent that the best, when you say the best topsoil, that's probably meaning the most fertile. Mm -hmm. So you have the most productivity. So you have the most, the plants are taking CO2 out of the atmosphere you know, at the highest rate. Mm -hmm. I think that's usually what we mean by good topsoil, because we care about plants again, because we like to eat, you know, all the good, the goodies. So, yeah. Fishing for questions out yeah. there. Uh, the, uh, there's natural absorption of CO2 in the biosphere, and I was wondering if you could, what fraction of that is terrestrial uh, versus oceanic? Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, related to that, is there uh, a terrestrial analog to uh, ecosystem impacts like ocean acidification? Got it. Yeah, good question. So I think probably the first part of your question is um, referring to the fact that right now when, so we're releasing about Humans release something on the order of nine petagrams, or nine times 10 to the 15 grams of carbon every year of CO2 to the atmosphere. But only half of that is staying in the atmosphere. About half of it each year is taken up by the biosphere, by the ocean and terrestrial system. So we're getting this huge, uh, we're being saved from ourselves, this huge benefit by having natural systems taking up about half of the carbon that, that we emit. It's often called a carbon sink. And about just about 50-50, half of that's going in the ocean and half of that is going into the land. And it's a really important point that when people think about the effects of anthropogenic emissions, of our CO2 emissions, they are assuming that sink continues. But the fact is that we really don't know where the carbon is going and we don't know why. So it is then clearly, we can't predict how long will this happen. And, and as John Hart says, we don't know when the sink will clog. And then what happens is we bear the full brunt of all of our emissions. So then the, I think the second part of your question was referring to that if you have more CO2 dissolving into the ocean, you get more acidic water. And that makes it hard for many different kinds of organisms that make their, their skeleton or exoskeleton or shells out of a carbonate, it makes it harder to precipitate that material, harder for coral reefs. So on land, you might say, well, what's the problem with more carbon? And to some extent, if you're thinking about soils, there, there isn't, at least from an anthropogenic point of view. Generally, more soil carbon is more fertile, but it's how you get there. If you try to increase carbon storage in a management sense, you're probably adding nutrients or water, and then you're changing a lot of things and making the system more vulnerable to, to disturbance. But I think um, there is a limit to how much carbon ecosystems can absorb, much more than so for them for the ocean. And we don't know what that limit is, but it probably has to do with light limitation. You get a closed canopy, you just can't fix more. Nutrient limitation, you've already taken up the available nitrogen. And probably the current sink is a response to past disturbance. We've deforested, like we deforested the Northeast, there's disturbance and deforestation in the tropics that are regrowing, and that's probably taking up the carbon. So it's quite likely that the, what we call this terrestrial sink is not sustainable a sort of just a natural fertilization effect. And it's, it's because it's a carbon cycle. The more carbon plants fix, they also, that material is shed into the soil and microbes decompose it and you get CO2 release. So that cycle means that eventually those systems will probably stop taking up more CO2 and it's not, uh, it's not the savior we should count on, you know, in terms of taking up half of our emissions every year. We have perhaps, um, yeah. Time for one more question, if anybody has one out there. And uh, if not, I, I, I'm just wondering, about, we often talk about carbon cycles as kind of a, st a stable notion, that mm -hmm. a cycle is something that's stable. Yeah. And when we're talking about climate change these days, we're talking about you know instability. I'm just wondering, is it possible that what we think of right now as a stable carbon cycle could be um, sort of 
uh, revved up at a different level, have, have a diff uh, right now our, we have an instability, but could there be another plateau, mm -hmm. a very different sort of carbon cycle with different degrees? I mean, uh, I'm thinking perhaps of another planet even. Um, it, right. uh, is it possible right. that maybe historically um, there were, was mm -hmm. a, a stable carbon cycle that looked very different from what we have and now, I think is what I was trying to say. Yeah, indeed, indeed. We can think about the era of the dinosaurs, or Cretaceous, and think about times in Earth's history when it was warmer and wetter and we had much more CO2 and methane in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. I mean, Earth has gone through very cold glacial cycles as well, but we've been through much warmer cycles. Now, if you think about just the last million years, you think about human history, we're now at just, a, just about as warm as it gets and certainly more CO2. But if you go further back, go 60 million years back, then you'll see that, uh, yeah, we can have a Earth that goes on to produce new species and you know have a have a future that lands us here um, with which much higher CO2. But it's important when you look at those past worlds or past Earths that they do look very different. Um, you don't, and so if we want to count on humans being supported by that Earth, then we have to think of, you know, does that work work for us? But um, definitely. Well, before we wrap things up, I want to point out that uh, we're going to have uh, Marion Fuller, who is a uh, principal nice. research associate at uh, EETD, um, talking a, a different aspect of, uh, of energy, um, talking about um, efficiency for sale, who's buying, uh, kind of the science, not only of, of trying to explain how people can save energy, but actually getting getting them to buy into the process. I think it'll be a fascinating um, discussion. And, and that won't be for three weeks. Um, it's on July 27th at this same place at that same hour. And so um, first of all, I want to thank you, Margaret, thank you. for coming. Um, it's been a fascinating hour. And really appreciate your, your time here. Thank you. And I also want thank to thank you. the audience for coming. Some of you have been here uh, to all three, all three of these events. Um, if you enjoyed it, tell your friends. <laughs>